workforce, and I value the diverse perspectives that I get from my employees. And I believe that my employees feel included and valued. But taking people and breaking them all into categories and then celebrating the differences of those categories has the seeds of destruction built right within it. And all you need is a working knowledge of the story of the Tower of Babel to understand that. So in Genesis 11:6 it says, and the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they have one language and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. So God basically acknowledges that when you can unite people around one goal, there's almost nothing that they can't achieve. And because what they were trying to achieve was dishonoring to God, he basically did a diversity and inclusivity program. He gave them all different languages. And they all focused on their differences, and the whole thing came to, to an end. And that's what most of these diversity and, and inclusivity programs actually do. They get everybody focused on their differences rather than their eye on the ball. Everybody's scrabbling about trying to find their rainbow badge, and, and nobody's focusing on what needs to get done. And there's a study, a Harvard study, that shows of 829 companies over 31 years showed that diversity training had no positive effect in the average workplace. And we could talk about implicit bias and the money that's wasted on that program, that there's no tangible proof that that makes any difference at all. So the other thing that I know um, because of a Christian worldview is that, now, I know some might misunderstand this, but the law excites rebellion. The law excites rebellion. In Romans 7 and 5, it says, I also know that, uh, it says, um, for while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. As a father, I have learned to have few rules. And the Lord masterfully synthesized, I gotta be careful when I got people like Joe and Jonathan here what I say, but, but, but basically God masterfully synthesized the law in 10 simple commandments, for the most part negative commandments. But when the owners of organizations, the directors of organizations do not see themselves as being under God, they go about to set up their own morality. And then suddenly, they've got to institutionalize that morality by an endless list of rules. And the more rules and the more laws you have, the more cynicism and rebellion you promote. Now, just a working knowledge of Scripture tells me that. And so rather than spending endless dollars on this kind of program, simply understanding that I'm at rest under God and allowing that rest and that grace and that mercy to flow to my employees can make a, a, a huge difference. And that is one of the big competitive advantages that we have. So because we love our employees, we don't want them worrying constantly about how they're going to provide for their families when they retire. So we take some profits and we invest that prof those profits in their retirement. We make sure that they have a good, um, a good benefit plan, or at least a reasonable benefit plan. And we want them to use the skills that they have in the best way that they can. So we try to give them opportunities to do that, making sure that they feel heard and valued and making sure that they have the tools, not pirated tools, but that they have the right tools to do the job that they need to do. And those things, which are not me or my wisdom, they're the wisdom of God, allow for what, what millions on diversity programs cannot produce. Now, the other thing that our Christian worldview tells us is that when we are focused on providing true value, God takes delight in that. The verse here says, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. Most of us know that God does not like dishonesty. But sometimes we forget the rest of this word, verse. It says, but a just weight is his delight. God takes delight in a fair deal. He takes delight in a fair deal. And when I am 
concentrating not on making the optics right, which as salespeople we all can be tempted to do, I've done it, but when I focus on saying, is this really providing value to my customer? God is working with me when I'm doing that. And the king's heart is in his hand. And a business that is constantly focused on providing true value has wind in its sails. So if you want to start a business, one of the most important things you have to say is, what is the need out there? Not, what do I, what would, I, what do I really want to do? What's fun for me? What do I really enjoy? I mean, that's important, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is, what does this world need? What need is there in this world that I have been uniquely equipped to fill? And if you can find a way to provide that value at a lower cost than what people are willing to, to pay for it, you've got the makings of a business. And then if you can learn to execute on that again and again and again, and when you have customer satisfaction issues, work with integrity to fix them, you've got the makings of an excellent business. And if that sounds easy, it's not. But there is no one better equipped, this is my point, there is no one better equipped to face that challenge than you. Because you have a worldview that enables you to face that challenge. Well, the last thing I want to talk about under this is that you have the ultimate SME, the ultimate subject matter expert. I'm in the business, I have a corporate training business, and, and as a corporate trainers, I often say that we're in the business of changing behavior. I do a lot of that at home too, um, but in the corporate world, we are focused on changing behavior. And if I view people as being nothing more than um, the products of a random evolutionary process, it's pretty hard to find rules that consistently work on someone that is produced as a result of a random evolutionary process. But I don't believe that. I believe that we are made in the image of God. And I believe that the people that I'm trying to instruct have a moral awareness that they can perceive what is good and what is bad. Though they are fallen, they have the image of God in them. And they can have an appreciation for what is beautiful and what is good. Now, in corporate communications or in corporate training, you're always vying for people's attention. And I find that corporate imagery and things like that are very sterile and boring for people. But when I can appeal to the image of God in them, it makes a remarkable difference. So I want to just show you an example. We were working for, this is just a prototype, and so it has a watermark on it. But it was a, um, the kickoff for a code of conduct training program. And in it, I just want to show you this. You'll see how we try to appeal to the image of God in man and how this can capture attention in the way that traditional things don't. Um, what? So in, in some senses, <clears throat> recognizing that my kids are watching me and that the things that I do and the patterns that I set in my life, in business and in other things, um, I'm going to pass on to them has a much more compelling effect on people that are made in the image of God, I believe, than giving them a whole bunch of do's and don'ts and laws of things that they must do in their expense report and everything like that. So we try to appeal to the image of God in man. The other thing that I, that I would say um, is that there is no one that knows better how to train people than the one that created them in his image. And the Lord Jesus, if we look at his life, we see many things that he did in order to, to train people. He would withhold information if he didn't feel that the heart was right to receive the word. So, for example, in the parable of the sower, remember the parable of the sower? There, was, um, there, was, there were three different soil types that could not receive the word, and the word could not grow in those. One was, um, and I call it the... Uh, the disinterested mind, one is the distracted mind, and one is the abstract mind. So the disinterested, the distracted, and the abstract. So the disinterested was it falls on the path, yeah, I don't really care, notice the bird takes it, 
goes away. And the, the um, distracted was, yeah, it landed, but there's all these thorns, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches and the less of other things. And so it doesn't actually take root and grow. And then there's the abstract mind. Oh, yeah, that's really good. Yeah, I love this theory. It's really good. But then when it comes to the application, there's no application. So in the training that we try to do, we realize that there are three enemies that we are fighting for when we are trying to get people's attention and get them to learn. We're, we're fighting against the distracted mind, we're fighting against the disinterested mind, and we're fighting against merely academic knowledge that doesn't relate in any uh, retention or transference into the workplace. And so I want to show you just an example of another program that we did. The predecessor program was like a two-hour program, and it was supposed to inculcate a customer service or kind of a, uh, a go-to-market strategy, if you will, and it just wasn't being affected. So we, we changed it into what worked out to be like a 15-minute program where we tried to address that. We tried to use the emotions and a sense of what is relevant in order to get the interest of people. Um, we tried to get to the mind by making things short, using metaphors very effectively and video effectively, and an application through putting people in a risky situation, forcing them to make decisions with the information. So I'll just show you a little bit of this program. Again, it's watermarked. Uh, in some of it, I can't play the audio, but I'll show you what I can. So people come into the program. Immediately, we make it relevant by having them choose their role. And then we get to their emotions through a video that sort of synthesizes. I'll play the video for you quickly. So after we've sort of reached the emotions in a bit, a person moves to the next phase of this. And they, and they said, basically, um, they navigate. And it says, OK, there's just three pages, three things you got to know. Instead of 50 pages that you have to go through in this sort of death by next, there's three pages. Um, and so, I don't have a mouse here, but anyway, they, they go to the first page and they say, oh, let's, let's watch just a little two-minute thing here. So we reason from the known to the unknown metaphors and things like that. And then they just scroll down, say, okay, yeah, whatever, 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 um, the mind. And then they say, okay, well, let's see the next one here. And they do the same thing, they do the same thing a third time, and then we put them into a situation where there's some risk. I can't play audio on this one, but they basically get faced with a, a real life situation where they, they run into somebody and um, something comes up, they have to make, um, and eventually they have to make a decision. They make a decision, they experience the outcome of that decision, and so on. So the whole thing, very, very short, but I don't know, um, we just feel that if we can produce something, taking the wisdom that we get from the Word of God and the way that Jesus taught those that were made in his image, it gives us a significant advantage. Okay, so I'm, I'm just about done, but I want to leave you with some takeaways because I want to give you something that you can actually work with. What do you do if you are in a large company right now? And I said, what you can do is avoid big company-itis. So, um, a lot of times when uh, I'm doing an interview or something and me and my colleague, we're interviewing someone and they leave and we say, so what do you think? And we say, ah, oh, he's got big company-itis. So there's nothing wrong with working in a big company. I've worked in a big company um, um, that, uh, uh, for, for seven years and it was great, a great learning experience. But the thing is that if you're in a big organization, soak up that learning, learn how to meet deadlines, learn how to interact with people, it's all good. But Make sure that you, you can make your value proposition stand alone. If your value proposition can't stand without that company's brand, without their business card, without their systems, without their infrastructure, then they've got the golden handcuffs on you. You need to look at what it is that you can provide within the context of that company, and you've got to understand how you can make that value proposition stand alone. And you have to be purposeful about it because it doesn't happen by accident. You have to think about how does this stand alone? You say, well, I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm not one of those guys that, you know, is, you know, always coming up with new ideas and trying to, you know, sell smoke and mirrors to people that, you know, I'm just not that type of a person. I don't do that stuff. Well, what I would say to you is that there are three key rules that every, organiza every organization needs, three key leaders. And those three leaders are, first of all, you need a salesperson, someone that's good at sales, 
someone that's a technologist or a subject matter expert, and somebody that is a manager. Now, I think I have some way to clean this off. Um, organizations go through phases. So if you, I'm not sure if you can see this, but if you have a chart, and it's, this is growth and this is time, organizations that start off, they usually start like this, and then they go like this, and then they go like this. Now, at this phase here, where you're coming up with what your product needs to be, the technologist usually, uh, usually is the person that needs to be at the leading. But then when you go to market with a product, your salesperson needs to take more of the, the lead. But then when you start get a number of customers and you want to scale your business, you need a manager that can take the lead. And then the companies tend to bifurcate. They'll come up with new product lines and new product lines like that. And so different phases in the company requires um, different people to take a role, the manager, the sales, and the technologist or the subject matter ex expert. So don't think that it's just people that have these really cool ideas and are really salesy that are entrepreneurs. If you are good at managing, if you have the ability to organize things, you can see the vision to getting a project done, you can organize people around a vision and get that done, make sure that that value proposition stands alone. Um, if you are a person that is focusing on a certain type of law, uh, and you have a subject matter expertise in that, focus on that and then network with people that do the same type of thing. Um, if you are particularly good at uh, research, make sure that you're not tied to the expensive facilities that you have there. Think about how that value proposition that you have can stand alone. Okay, so what if I'm just starting out? There is, it's, it's often the best thing to start with another company to learn how to provide value, to learn how to get things done in time frames, to learn how to, um, to um, work under people, to learn how to, 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 to serve them. Again, make sure your value proposition starts alone. And I, the biggest thing I would say is take responsibility. Take responsibility. Don't go to your supervisor and say, well, what should I do about this? I don't, like, what, what do you want me to do about this? Say, um, this is the problem. Uh, these are the potential solutions. These are the risks. This is what I suggest we do. And if nobody's told you to ask, just do it. Because that's how you get, you take responsibility and you can grow in your role. There are too many people that want someone to tell them how to think and what to do all the time. What if I'm a ministry worker? What about, what about you? Well, there's so much that could be said here, but the one simple thing I would say is provide value. Provide quality value. Don't fall into saying, well, it's because they're carnal that they don't listen to what I have to say. If they were just more spiritual, they would listen to me. No. Spend more time preparing. Spend more time doing a quality job of everything you do. And the last thing I would say is see obstacles or see opportunities where others see obstacles. I, won't, I don't have time to get into How much time do I have? OK. Um, the basis of my company, there was three things that I'll share with you. There was more, but three things in particular that were, that were the foundations of the company, but they were very, very painful experiences for me personally. So the first one was when I was in university, if, if you had told me when I was in university that someday you're going to run a corporate learning company, I would have laughed at you because I was the worst student. Uh, I don't know why this didn't come out in high school so much, but in university, I was, I was an economics major, and I couldn't get information into my head. I, I would be reading my economics textbook, and I'd get to the end of a chapter, and I had no recollection of what I just read. It's just not going in. And, and, and going over my lecture notes, it just it wasn't working for me. And as exams got closer and closer, I got more and more panicky. I still actually have a recurring nightmare about this. I don't know if you know what I mean by that, but I, I, I literally do. Uh, later on, like, I'm sure they would have diagnosed me as having some kind of a concentration disorder or whatever, but later on I learned that I was trying to learn with the wrong learning style. It just didn't work for me. I won't tell you how that happened, but I did get through. And later on, when I was with, in a, a large organization and I was working with a lot of people, I recognized in others that same fear and angst that I felt. People were being forced not to, not, not so they could understand economics, but so that they could change um, fast enough to keep up with the industry. And they weren't getting materials that they could absorb at the speed they needed to, and it was creating a lot of fear, and I developed a real empathy for people that couldn't learn fast enough to keep up with change. 
And because I had to work so hard to understand things, it, it became sort of a, a thing that I got good at was making the complex simple. And I was in the IT marketplace. And in the IT marketplace, everyone's talking, no one's communicating. It's like the emperor's clothes. Everybody's using big buzzwords and acronyms. You know all about that, right? And everybody thinks that everybody understands, and nobody wants to say that they don't understand because they don't want to look stupid. But nobody gets it. So I sort of had this little niche, which was kind of like a business to IT alignment, where I could translate between the, the propeller heads and the business people that actually use the stuff. Because I had an empathy that came out of my own personal pain. And I also had a desire to solve that problem. Later on, I was with a smaller organization. I had 30 salespeople that worked for me, and I, um, I really wanted them to be good consultative salespeople. And so I invested a lot in trying to train them and doing role plays and things like that. And everybody would be all excited at training like you guys, and they'd come high-fiving out the door. But two weeks later, everything was back to the way it was before. And it used to bother me that we would put so much investment in training people, but there was no retention. Very little retention and very little transfer to the employees. It was a difficult thing for me. Later on, I, I uh, was the president of a, a small software company, and it failed. Um, it's a long story. I had four partners. One of them got really sick. One of them got really crazy, and, and the other two took off and left me with a bag. And, and, uh, and, and, and 18 months, you know, I was, I was sort of on my own trying to run this thing and, and having to, you know, basically close the company. It was a painful experience for me. But, and that brought to, the, to my mind the idea, well, could software development be brought together with learning to produce greater attention and to make things, um, training more uh, palatable to people's learning style, which was the basis for my company. So you can, you have to realize that it doesn't come easy, but the painful things are often opportunities. And there really is no failure as a Christian. There's no failure because the Lord works through even those painful things um, to bring about uh, success. Well, the last thing I want to do, I want to ask you this. So with all of this, why would it be that taking a risk would not result in success? And I want to give you three barriers to success that I want to leave with you. Three barriers to success, three reasons why the Lord would perhaps not be on your side in a business venture. The first one is this, pursuing your business without deciding what's enough. Pursuing a business without deciding what is enough. The opposite is to decide what is enough and release everything beyond that. Because sometimes God does not give us wealth because he knows that it would pierce us through with many sorrows and cause untold stress in our lives. So if you have not decided what's enough, you're not ready to start a business. Barrier two, not thinking beyond the span of your life. To have no plan for how to continue to influence this earth beyond your death. You have too small of a window. The opposite is invest in people and things that will enable you to influence the world long after you're gone. And barrier three, to fear death and see it for all practical purposes as the end of all things. And the opposite is, to be convicted that life continues and continues more richly beyond death. And then you must give account to your Lord and King for the opportunities that he gave you. So, I want to convince you to take more risk. I want to convince you to move away from security. The Bible tells you that you should. This world desperately needs you to and your worldview equips you and enables you to. It is not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy, but you are the ones to do it because God has uniquely equipped you. Is there any questions? Randy. Um, so this is a business lecture. And I'm, I'm wondering, uh, are you seeing um, these business principles as applicable to other fields? So I think some of us in here, including myself, I'm a physicist. There's not really business application to the theories that I'm generating. There's some philosophers, theologians in here. Um, and tying that into freedom, it seems like you know, with money, you have a lot of worldly freedom. 
So could somebody such as myself or philosopher or theologian maybe see just the, the pursuit of money as a pursuit of freedom, which could be used for the benefit of others? Well, there's a couple of questions there. First of all, I'm not sure that I agree with your premise. Um, that because, as I, as I said before, um, I do believe that, the, that someone that is a physicist, for example, has a subject matter expertise. And while it might not be immediately apparent as to how that can be productized in order to generate wealth, um, the pursuit of physics is something that has, you know, brought us out of, you know, despair and brought us out of, you know, uh, um, has given us many of the, um, the things that allow us to, to function in a civilized society and can bring, bring rest to people. I don't know enough about your particular field of research, but I would say again that subject matter expertise uh, is very important and ideas are very important and thinkers are very important and I think when thinkers align themselves with people um, that are in their field, I mean you talk to James afterwards, he's got some pretty heady technologist or one in particular that works alongside him and I don't know, um, I think it would be important to think about how that skill set can be married with those that have the sales capability and those that have the managerial capability in order, and it's maybe not a small company, but maybe it's a smaller company than, than, a, than a massive uh, pharmaceutical or whatever it is. Um, so I would, I would want to challenge you to think about, uh, about that. Um, what was the rest of your question? Tying it into money, so uh, money can buy freedom, essentially, and so I, like, just the context of my question, I think it would be applicable for some mm -hmm. others here. Like, so my position, um, I could try to uh, pursue professorship and teaching, you know, that's obviously directly relevant to my studies. Uh, or I could go into banking, like physicists uh, are welcome to many banks. So it's kind of like a pure finances or something that's more obviously relevant. The finances can bring freedom. Yeah, so in one respect, I think money is a distillation of value. It isn't the only distillation of value. And so you just mentioned two things. So being a professor that has a Christian worldview is very, very powerful in the, in the university because I believe that, uh, and Joe will tell you this again and again, that so many of the advances that we have seen have come from Christians. And so people that can take a lost, you know, our, our universities are in many, way, in many ways a disaster and they need someone that has a Christian worldview, so there's clearly value there. Um, so, um, I don't think that money is the only way. I do believe that we can bring rest to people through the exercise of our skills. It isn't necessarily money, that is one way. Another question? Um, so I'm, I'm in healthcare, likely going to be at some point managing and stewarding my own business. Personally, um, finances are way in the red as a risk to acquiring the, the knowledge and that. What would, what is your, I guess, angle on operating in a, a, a fallen world and, and a financial system that doesn't adhere to biblical principles that we have for debt repayment and, and things like that. Is there is there a way right now, maybe on a grander level, but is there a way that I can operate within that sphere, bringing Christian principles to debt repayment and then being given more authority later on to operate on a biblical business level? Like, what are your thoughts just in entering into to debt, taking on sure. yeah. 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 Um, I think in debt, you know, the, 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 the borrower is serving to the lender. And I think debt is a huge issue with, with, with businesses. I think there is a good debt, and I think there is a bad debt. But generally speaking, I grew my business without debt. I grew it organically. It's a very slow and it's a very painful process to do that, um, but your ability to sustain recession and things like that, um, I think is, is, is significantly better. Um, I think for the most part, I'm, I'm very against debt. Um, now, basically bridging receivables is one thing, um, or having a property that has, has value uh, that, you have, um, that you could very quickly uh, sell that, so having short-term assets versus long-term assets, that's a different thing. I think the other question you were asking is about um, you know, um, school debt, I think you were asking. So I actually, you know, and I, and, I, and I don't mean to say this to put anxiety into people's hearts, because some of us are just in that situation, but I think it's a real problem. 
You know, I think it really puts the handcuffs on people, and I think people get out of university, they want to get married, and then they're saddled with debt for years and years to come. And I, I don't have a short-term answer for what you can do in your situation, but I, I really push my children that are in university and, 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 and uh, postgraduate work to do everything in their power not to take on debt. I know that seems impossible, but not, you know, it's a cattle on a thousand hills. I think we need to um, really be careful about that. Another question? Thank you so much for your talk. Um, so I just wanted to ask about, um, um, we were saying how, uh, how can you make your business, like, um, I guess, like, more secure, too? Because you asked them about, like, retirement, and, and will you save money for, like, retirement for the people to take care of them? So in a sense, like, we are going to those kind of people who are entrepreneurs, but then um, when we make our business, are we, are we trying to go towards a more secure, like, foster a more secure environment for them? So isn't it kind of just a little bit, um, counter just because after yeah, our business important. we don't want them we don't we don't want to yeah. you know be unstable and stuff yeah. to the people under us yeah so the, you know the question really is well you said that we shouldn't seek so much security so you, as you as a Christian business person you're trying to provide security for your people isn't that kind of counter to what you said well what I would say is this is that remember not everybody has the same risk tolerance not everybody has the same risk appetite you shouldn't risk what you cannot afford to risk and, um, and I believe that one of the, the things that really makes capitalism work is when those that will take a risk are good to the people that provide the labor. One of the things that creates the polarization that we're seeing um, in society and, and gives rise to you know, uh, socialism and things like that and cultural Marxism is when employees become very Machiavellian and just say, you know, I'm taking care of me, I'm taking care of number one. And I think there's countless scriptures that tell us that we are to be good to, that masters are to be good to those that work for them. We should have family values. We should help people um, to, uh, you know, to care for their children, help people to care, to take care of their futures. If we take away their, their fear, they are going to bring greater productivity. Um, but I also think that we don't try to hold someone back that has greater skills in the organization. We try to move them, we should try to move them to fully um, uh, express what they can do and give them more and more responsibility. Um, but I don't think we say, well, no, we want to make you uh, more productive, so uh, we think if we give you no security, like basically they'll go somewhere else. And, and so I think, um, I, I think what I was trying to say there is that God's grace and mercy to me causes me to want to push that mercy and grace out, out to my employees and make a better working environment that some of the programs that are putting in place and costing a lot really aren't achieving. So I'm not sure if that's a, the complete answer to what seems to be a, a bit of a contradictory comment, but I, I don't think it is because we have, there are those that start businesses, there are those that support businesses, we need both, and the business owners need to be good to the people that are providing the labor and help to move them along. I trust, um, we both kind of shared our common background um, My HP friend. Yeah, um, I get, I get, I get your your thesis. You know, in terms of uh, your presentation would be successful if we all kind of look towards moving to the right of that security freedom uh, spectrum. Um, in all the things that you've done in over your life, how have you negotiated or discerned a God's calling as you make that progression? Because oftentimes, as you make that pro progression, you find yourself at a crossroad. Right? You have to take decision A or B. And oftentimes, at least in my life, I've got to make these decisions fairly quickly. I don't have a whole lot of time to soul search and blah, blah, blah. So are there, just briefly quick, uh, things that you do to discern and negotiate God's calling as you try and get to, to the right side of that spectrum? Yeah, no, it's, it's a really, really great question. And, and it really comes down to how do you know the mind of the Lord? You know, and, and I would love to be able to tell you, well, the Lord just wrote it in the sky for me. But the, the, the truth is that it was a controlled stumble, you know, more often than not. And the scriptures say to us, Paul says, as you have obeyed in my presence, so much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is working in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. Um, so I think that... Um, I remember when I was at Hewlett Packard at the building that you work in right now, I was sitting in that cafeteria on the first floor, and I remember getting my first retirement statement, 
and it said that if I was to retire now, I'd make $12 a month or something like that. And I remember thinking at that particular point, I remember thinking, I am never going to get free if I stay here. And though it took a couple of years before I actually left, I'm not saying you should leave, but I'm, uh, uh, that was a milestone in my thinking. The other milestone was I remember getting a, a paycheck, um, a, my first commission check, and I remember being 0 .0, or 0 0.035% of the revenue or something like that. I thought, you know, that company car is not free. That benefit package is not free. So there were milestones in my life that were pushing me in a direction. And so when the opportunity came up and someone says, you're getting a 10% of margin, um, I jumped at it. I was very fearful after I jumped at it. But I think it's, it's the kind of thing where you can't make a decision on the spur of the moment like that. I think if you're on your knees in the word of God daily, searching the scripture, it, scriptures, not just going to God for answers to problems, but if we take the Word of God seriously and we pray and we ask God to put us in the company of people and open up those doors for us, that He will work in us. But we have, there will never be a time, there has never been a time in my life where I've had to make a decision that took no faith. You know, it takes faith, the just must live by faith. So the Lord gives you sometimes, there's a, a bit of a sense of direction. Maybe people here have got a bit of a sense of direction. Um, and then you have to be attentive to what God is saying in his word, and then when decisions come, you have to act in faith upon those. But there is, I can't say that God writes it in the sky for me. I think it's a, it's a controlled stumble. And sometimes, I mean, the, the Lord sent hornets to drive, you know, some of the Canaanites out. And sometimes the Lord pushes us out and makes us do things. And sometimes when we don't go his way, he pulls the rug out from under us. And he makes us, uh, us go. But it's not all on you. That's the great thing. It's not all on you. If I miss this one opportunity, it's gone for life. No. If you seek the will of God, he will push you in the direction that you are to go. And, and he will take you there. We can make it harder or easier. relates to this, but it also relates to family. So my question is, how, what do you say to women who feel like, yes, they need to do all these things and be involved in business and all that, but at the same time feel conflicted because they feel like they should be with their children? That's it. I'm so glad that you asked that question. Because I believe, um, I believe that there is a stage in our lives and, and I'm sorry, call me old-fashioned, but particularly in mothers, that you, you need to be home with your kids. Um, I really believe that. I think as much as possible, we, we, when the kids are at a young age, we should provide, uh, we should seek to provide the opportunity um, uh, for them to be home and not to be sending them off to daycare. I just got to say that, um, however you feel about that. But if you read Proverbs 31, the woman in Proverbs 31, she was a businesswoman. And I think it's great for women to have household business. I, I remember working for a lawyer, and uh, she had a, an office in her home, and she had a kid in the playpen. I know my own wife um, worked in a business, and she had her kid in, our kid now, in a playpen um, while she was doing what she was doing. I think the home can be a tremendous um, opportunity, a tremendous place to have a business and to run a business from. And I think raising children and knowing the stress that stresses that mothers have and, and knowing those things um, can help you to understand needs and pain that others have and to administer minister to that. Um, Susie, we could tell you about, I don't know if you have, talked about your friend who is a, um, what was her business? Your, your friend that, for a West that had that business that was on Dragon's Den? Oh yeah, Easy Daisies. I don't know if anyone knows about it. But just tell her what, what the business was. Just yeah, so over. she, well she was a teacher, a school teacher, and then she wanted to have children, so she didn't want to be a full-time teacher, so she was at home, and because she has teaching background, she created all these um, really interesting things for like autistic children to learn and magnetic things and whatever and did this out of her home as she was raising her children and then she went on Dragon's Den and now she has this full home business that she basically operates out of her garage. So it's like, yeah, there's so a lot of possibilities. God's command is exceeding And she is a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. God's commandment is exceeding broad and if for a period of time we're confined to a certain domain, we shouldn't see that as imprisonment we should see that the opportunities can emerge
from that domain um, to minister to other women that you understand far better than someone like I, like, like, like me, and to minister to them perhaps in, in how they are trying to um, uh, to raise their children. Um, and I'll tell you this too. Um, when my business really took off, I uh, was when Susan. And you know, I, I get a little choked up about it because um, <clears throat> I don't think that women realize the role that they have with their husbands who are running businesses. So that'd be that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's it. So let's thank friends. Thank you for your attention.